Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to have been invited to speak in this lecture series of the Schenectady County Historical Society. I do apologize for not being able to be with you in person. The list of speakers in your lecture series includes such esteemed historians as Evan Heffley, David Voorhees, the Lou Roper, and Andrea Hosterman, Mosterman. I can only hope that my contribution will not diminish the overall quality too much. My topic for today is fortifications in New Netherlands. Some years ago, I was involved in a project of the New Holland Foundation, an organization specializing in Dutch overseas heritage, in particular forts, of which there are many, from the East India Company forts in Indonesia and Sri Lanka to West India Company forts in West Africa and South America. The organization is led by archaeologist Oscar Hefting, who asked me to research Dutch fortifications in New Netherlands. My findings were published in 2015 in a report which you can download for free from the website of the New Holland Foundation. My talk today is based on this research. Of course, I am a historian, not an archaeologist. I research paper stuff, manuscripts, publications, maps. So I will start what is one of the most iconic of maps of New Netherland, the Castello Plan and the best known fort, Fort Amsterdam. Despite all the problems associated with it, the Castello Plan provides us with a good impression of the importance of Fort Amsterdam, which dominated the capital of New Netherland. The fort, suitably furnished with a red, white, blue Dutch flag with a GWC, geoctroyeerde West Indische Compagnie, monogram, was the seat of the colonial government. An English description of September 1661 provides further details. A fort four square, a hundred yards on each side, at each corner flanked out twenty six yards. In the midst of the east and west side is a gate opposite to the other. The walls are built with lime and stone, and within filled up with earth to a considerable breadth for planting guns, where on are mounted sixteen guns. In this fort is the church, the governor's house, and houses for soldiers, ammunition, etc. In a nutshell, this English description of Fort Amsterdam encompasses the three general themes of my talk today. Function, location and construction of New Netherland fortifications. Before I proceed with my first theme, I need to make a preliminary remark. When I use the term fortification, I refer to all forms of defensive structures. Forts, blockhouses, stockades, gates, points, sconces, half-moons, ditches, moats, and so forth. So that includes both primary fortifications, such as forts and blockhouses, as well as supplementary fortifications, for instance, sconces and half-moons. Terminology is important here too. The exact Dutch words used in the 17th century sources often refer to specific types of fortifications, based upon notions that the colonists brought with them to the New World. Whether such notions retain their validity when confronted with New World conditions is a question to which I will return at the end. Function first, then. Fortifications had at least two functions, military and symbolic. First, the military function of a fortification was to facilitate defense against an enemy forces. These could be either European or indigenous, which of course different had which of course had different effects in its in terms of its military technology, especially firepower. It is generally assumed that Native Americans only acquired firearms, powder and lead on a regular basis from the sixteen thirties onwards, while they did not possess can cannons during the time that New Netherland was under Dutch rule. Fortifications aimed at repulsing Native American attacks thus did not require earthen walls, which absorbed the impact of cannonballs. Wooden palisades provided sufficient protection against arrows and, later in the 17th century, against musket balls. A clear line of sight was also required, so trees or bushes surrounding the fortifications had to be cleared. 
We do not find in New Netherland full-blown European-style designs with detached outworks, revelins, from which intersecting lines of fire could cover the curtain walls and bastions of the inner fortification. To withstand a native attack, simple structures sufficed. A case in point is the earliest Dutch fortification in New Netherland, Fort Nassau, constructed in 1614 on Castle Island just south of Albany. Fort Orange, built a decade later, is also indicated on this Ving Bones map. Johannes de Laat, who never visited the New World, describes Fort Nassau as a small fort in the form of a redoubt, a fortje in the form of a redoubt. The word redoubt, or in Dutch ronduit, is derived from the Italian ridotto, literally place of retreat. In the terminology of the time, it indicates an enclosed defensive emplacement without points. Lent and Tillo's reconstruction, uh, that you can see here, is quite good, I think, although the term redoubt makes it unlikely that Fort Nassau had two points, as Lent suggests. To defend colonies against European competitors who could employ artillery and mount full-scale assaults, substantial constructions were required, even though these were still not as elaborate as those, as those used in the European theatres of war. The four-pointed fort was the standard form. The bastions allowed the defenders to use lines of sight that covered all the curtain walls, leaving no blind spots in which an enemy could hide. It may come as a surprise that Fort Orange was built in the shape typical of defense against European competitors. When the decision to build Fort Orange was taken, its location close to the confluence of the Hudson and Mohawk rivers was the northern edge of New Netherland. The topography of much of the hinterland was still unknown to the Dutch. They were, of course, aware of the presence of the French in Canada. Fort Orange thus served as a frontier marker, indicating to anyone entering New Netherland from the north that this was the colony's boundary. And that brings me to the second function of fortifications, their role as representations of governmental and judicial power and authority. There are two elements here. First, the role of the fortification as the seat of government and the location of courthouses and second, forts as the embodiment of territorial claims. I will be brief about the first element. If there was a fort in a settlement, it usually housed the local court of justice. That applies to Fort Orange as the location of the court of Fort Orange and Beverwijk, to Fort Casimir for the court of New Amstel and to Fort Amsterdam as the location of the court of appeal of director general and council. As to the second element, the role of fortifications in claiming territory operated on three different levels between European countries, vis-à-vis -vis Native Americans and in what we might call internal Dutch conflicts. When the West India Company took control of New Netherland, it built fortified outposts on the three major river systems, the Delaware, the Hudson and the Connecticut. Establishing forts was one of the ways to substantiate a territorial claim as were European-style agriculture, taking actual possession, either through purchase or conquest in a just war, first discovery or a papal royal charter. While these arguments were primarily used in intra-European diplomatic and judicial conflicts, they occasionally surfaced in interactions with Native Americans as well. The main example in New Netherland is that of Director Willem Kieft demanding contributions from Native American groups in the vicinity of Fort Amsterdam. His ill-founded attempt to apply this European notion of a fortification to a new world situation was one of the causes of the subsequent war with the Native Americans. They remained unconvinced and refused to pay up, arguing that for them the Dutch fort did not constitute any form of protection. Yet within the European conception, the power of fortifications ranged well beyond its walls and extended to the range of the fort's guns. In 1652, Director General Petrus Stuyvesant asserted that the area within 250 Rhineland rods, that's about a, a kilometer, about 3,000 feet, of Fort Orange, fell under the jurisdiction of the West India Company, thus creating the village of Beverwijk. Stuyvesant's intervention was, of course, part of the larger conflict between the West India Company and the patroons, including Kilian van Rensselaer. Van Rensselaer's assertion of his rights as patroon is evident as a, in a 1644 incident. Following orders from the patroon, 
Nicolas Korn had established a fortification called Rinselaarstein on Beren Island, now Beren Island, south of Kuymans on the Hanakwa Creek. Beren Island formed the southern border of the patroonship and with the recent opening of the fur trade to private traders in mind, Van Rensselaer had conferred upon the island the staple right of Rensselaerswijk, thus forcing private ships to break bulk there for inspection and the payment of tolls. In this way, Van Rensselaer asserted the rights of his patroonship, but it put him on a collision course, both with, with the West India Company and with private traders. A few months later, Govard Lokermans sailed past Beren Island and Nicolas Korn ordered him to strike his flag. When Lokermans refused, Korn fired several shots, but Lokermans sailed on without returning fire. So in this slide, photo courtesy of Oscar Hefting, you see archaeologists Paul Uwe and Hans van Westing, who visited the location of this incident in 2011. And you can see that even now the site offers a good view over the river. And that brings me to my second th theme, location. Now, you may be familiar with the scene from Monty Python and the Holy Grail, in which a king informs his son that the other kings had told him he was daft to build a castle in the swamp, but he did it anyway, just to show him. After the first two castles had sunk into the swamp, he built another one, which fell over and then sank to the swamp. A fourth one finally stayed up. The Pythons used Dune Castle in Scotland as their location, and if you ever make it to Scotland, it's well worth a visit. Now, the Dutch in New Netherland were not so daft as to build in a swamp, but at least two forts, Fort Nassau and Fort Orange, were built so close to the river that they were severely damaged or partly washed away by spring floods. The same may have happened to Rensselaerstein, as Beren Island too probably changed shape due to floods in the 17th century or later. Only the Swedes built forts in, or rather near, a swamp. Fort near Elfsborg, on the Varkenskill, nowadays Salem Creek, near Salem, New Jersey, constructed in 1643. The Swedish soldiers quickly nicknamed it Fort Miggenborg, Fort Mosquito, for obvious reasons. It was abandoned in 1651, as many of the soldiers succumbed to malaria and the Dutch constructed Fort Casimir across the river, which pretty much made Fort Mosquito useless. Archaeologist Craig Lukacis communicated to me that changes to the shoreline make it possible that the site of the fort is now covered by the river, so it did sink into the swamp after all. It is of course easy for us to make jokes about the unfortunate choice of location by the 17th century Dutch or Swedes. We have the benefit of hindsight. In contrast, the soldiers who were tasked with building a fortification usually did not have an extensive knowledge of the area. They often arrived in late spring or early summer, after the early spring freshets, but well before mosquito season started. The leader of an expedition had to choose a location within a few days as the construction of a fortification which included making any buildings watertight, had to be completed before winter weather arrived. So the leader scrutinized the landscape with a quick eye, but with a mindset based on his European experience, which was not always suited to the new world realities. General considerations, such as proximity to transport lines, rivers and creeks, the availability of fresh water, the elevation of the terrain, and of course, operational purposes were foremost in his mind. Again, with hindsight, we can recognize that the best choices were made with, when leaders or colonists had local knowledge based on more than just a few years of experience. Fort Christina is a prime example. Peter Minuit erected this fort in 1638, after he had first been in North America in the service of the West India Company from 1626 to 1632. Its location, two miles from the Delaware River at a good landing place on the Christina River, was well hidden from view, useful as Minuit did not want to draw immediate attention to his presence. The location was surrounded by marshland, with only a small strip of dry land providing access to the fort. So Fort Christina was very well located for defensive purposes, although the proximity of marshland was not good for the health of the garrison. 
The Christina River was always also a good choice because the Swedes could now cut into the Dutch fur trade with the Minquas, the Susquehannock Indians, who used the Christina River to come down to the Delaware. The Dutch had previously conducted most of their fur trade on the Delaware River from Fort Nassau, near Gloucester City, New Jersey, established about 1627, which was only manned seasonally. Its location had many drawbacks. It was on the wrong side of the river and too far upstream, which was a disadvantage in the fur trade. The foundation of Fort Christina triggered what Charles Goering has rightly described as a chess game, with the Swedes establishing fortified trading posts in the larger Philadelphia area, cutting off Fort Nassau from the trade route formed by the Schuylkill River, the Schuylkill River, they call it in Philadelphia, of course. Meanwhile, Fort Nia Elfsburg obstructed the garrison at Fort Nassau in its access to the sea. In 1651, Petra Stuyvesant dismantled Fort Nassau and built Fort Casimir, just a few miles south from Fort Christina. This put the Dutch in a position to challenge the Swedes in the fur trade and also provided them with control of the river. The Swedish countermove came on Trinity Sunday, 1654, when the new Swedish governor Johan Riesing arrived and immediately captured Fort Casimir, renaming it Fort Trefaldigheten, Fort Trinity. In the end, however, Riesing's aggression backfired. The West India directors in Amsterdam were outraged and ordered Stuyvesant to retaliate, which he did in 1655, asserting Dutch dominance over the South River once more. Third team then, construction. The chess game on the Delaware shows that provincial, provisional fortifications could be constructed quickly if materials, manpower and money were in sufficient supply. Materials usually consisted of cut down trees for palisades, brushes and branches were used to construct gabions with earth being used as a filler. These natural materials quickly degraded of course the lifespan of palisades was estimated at three or four years. So in the Dutch Republic, the ramparts were usually protected from soil erosion by applying a layer of sods on the exterior and interior slopes. In the Dutch Republic, good quality sods with thick, short grass were readily available in the many grasslands used to graze cattle. This, however, was not the case in North America, where European-style agriculture was only just beginning to make an impact on the landscape. Fortifications in New Netherlands suffered greatly from erosion, due to winter weather and foraging hawks. The West India Company directors, who had no first-hand experience of the New World, ordered their servants in New Netherlands again and again to use sods, which in their view would be much less expensive. But their attempt at designing a new world from their comfortable meeting room in the West India House in Amsterdam was doomed to fail, as they were unable to grasp that circumstances in North America required the use of different building materials. Stone was only used in one case, for Amsterdam, here in an idealized early view, five-pointed and far too big. In reality, Fort Amsterdam was much smaller, and had four points, of which only one was constructed in stone in 1628. Plans to complete the stone construction were discussed several times, but progress was indifferent. Only in 1656, 30 years after construction was begun, did the Amsterdam directors give in to Stuyvesant's repeated requests. They hired three masons and sent them to New Amsterdam. Working steadily, they eventually managed to complete the stone walls, but it did take them four years. It is likely, by the way, that uh, black slaves of the West India Company helped with this work, probably carrying the stones. Manpower was clearly of the essence. Building a stone wall required specialist masons, but a provisional stockade could easily be erected by soldiers and colonists. In the case of Wildweg, Kingston, detailed information about the construction is available. The work took 60 men, about three weeks to complete. From the excavation of parts of the stockade by Joe Diamond, we know that the stakes used were of diff many different sizes, which is evidence of the hasty construction of that particular palisade. In the case of Wildwerk, we do not know how much it actually cost. 
through the construction of the Palisade on the north side of New Amsterdam, Wall Street, such information is available. A joint meeting of the Rector General and Council and the city government of Burgemeesters and Schepenen decided, and I quote, to fence off the greater part of the city with an upright stockade and a small breastwork, so as to be able to draw all inhabitants behind it in time of need and defend as much as possible their persons and goods against an attack. And they proceeded with a full description of what they envisioned, including a small drawing. This plan, however, proved much too expensive, and within days it was decided to use planks instead. Even so, a fence of 2,340 feet of nine planks high required 1,404 planks, as well as 340 posts, for a total of over 3,000 guilders. A special loan was required to raise funds. So that covers the three teams, themes, function, location and construction. Now, Let's take a closer look at the fortifications in the northern part of New Netherland. And you can see that there are 11. As I have already said something about Fort Nassau, Fort Orange, Rensselaerstein and Wildwijk, I will focus here on Beverwijk and Schenectady. First in Beverwijk, Albany, 1654. Beverwijk was created in 1652, of course, when the West India Company asserted its jurisdiction to the area within 3,000 feet of Fort Orange, thus carving a new village out of the patroon ship in Rensselaerswijk. As there were no fortifications in the area other than Fort Orange, which was in a bad condition, a number of structures were built in the ensuing years, including a guardhouse, a blockhouse and a a palisade. The blockhouse also doubled up as church in the early days. One of the first buildings to be constructed was a guardhouse, Kortegaard in Dutch, from the French word corps de garde, which is first mentioned in the records in 1654, but was likely built sometime earlier. It was strategically located near the entrance to Beverwijk from the north. Although no details are known, both its location and the fact that it was also used as a prison suggests that a guardhouse may have been a stronger construction than a regular house. However, its main function was to provide cover for the men on guard duty. In 1655, plans were drawn up to construct a blockhouse in Beverwijk. Jan Baptiste van Rensselaer, director of Rensselaerswijk, in a letter back to Amsterdam doubted whether it would be much use for him and others living outside of the town. In the aftermath of the Peach Ward downriver, the colonists at Beverwijk were quick to renew their friendship with the Morgs, but they did not solely rely on good relations. I quote, We will seek to fortify ourselves as much as possible, as we have already repaired the, the dilapidated fort, which was almost washed away by high water. We are also building a blockhouse in the village, but this can by no means keep our farms, our horses and livestock safe or defend them, and will only serve to defend our bodies and lives. In 1656, a square blockhouse of unknown size was built. Internally, it had a heavy wooden structures, structure, gebinten in Dutch, to provide extra support for the ordnance, which, according to Janne Venema, were and I quote, mounted behind loopholes in the overhanging balconies, that is, at the upper level. The magistrates of Beverwijk brought in three light pieces, which had previously been positioned in the patroon ship. The fortified, the fortified building, which was also used as a church, was located at the intersection in the middle of Beverwijk, with the views along the roads leading north, west and south. It was replaced by a stone building in 1715. Although the blockhouse church provided the colonists with some protection in case of an attack by the Indians, it did not constitute a perimeter defense, as Jan Baptiste's remark highlights. The outbreak of war with the Asopus Indians in 1659 provided the impetus to build a stockade in Beverwijk. And I quote, a stockade made of posts and planks, to wit, Eight boards high, with seven bastions to protect the curtains, which fence may surround the greater part of the village, the length of its circumference being 250 rods. Like the perimeter fence of New Amsterdam, 
The stockade at Beverwijk was constructed with horizontal planks rather than with vertical rods. With a height of eight boards, the, def the Beverwijk defense was slightly lower than the nine boards of New Amsterdam. Three weeks after the work was begun, the Beverwijk magistrates observed that a new palisade protected the village on the land side, but left the side of the river open. They therefore ordered owners of gardens on the river to build a fence of posts and planks from seven to eight feet high at the back of their property. This slide is a 19th century redrawing of a rough undated draft in the New York State Archives, which is very likely a sketch of the planned stockade of 1659. It is probable that the 1659 stockade had fallen into disrepair by 1670. In November of that year, the local authorities received instructions from the governor in New York to set up the entire circumference of Albany, as Beverwijk had been renamed, with straight oaken posts, 11 feet long, the least of them to measure 8 inches across at the thin end. This suggests a vertical palisade rather than a construction of horizontal planks. A few years later, when the outbreak of King Philip's war necessitated extra vigilance, it was decided to close openings in the stockade around the city with palisades, to close the portholes on the bastions on the inside and the outside with thick planks and to nail tight the three unnecessary gates. Schenectady then. Surprisingly, the village of Schenectady does not seem to have been palisaded until several years after it was founded in 1661, even though it was regarded at the, as the northeastern frontier of New Netherland and subsequently New York. Whenever fears of a France in French invasion surfaced, plans were drawn up to equip the village with some sort of defense. In 1671, Governor Francis Lovelace communicated to local officials that they should prepare defenses, set guard posts and construct a blockhouse. There is no documentary evidence that these orders were immediately carried out, but the blockhouse had apparently been constructed by 1675. When in late 1675 the outbreak of King Philip's War threatened to involve the settlers on the Hudson and Mohawk rivers, the Council at War of War at Albany ordered the commissioners and Schout, and I quote, to have the blockhouse in your village surrounded with palisades as a place of refuge, to retreat thereto in time of need. And if you think that the blockhouse surrounded with palisades is not sufficiently capable of defense, you may freely come to us here and you shall be welcome. Of course, fortifications were built later on, some of which were destroyed in 1690. Let me come to a conclusion. Function, location and construction are the three interlocking factors that shape the history of fortifications in New Netherlands. All three factors reveal evidence of the tension that colonists experienced when their old world heritage encountered the circumstances of the new world. Introducing European style fortifications into a new environment required flexibility and adaption. The difference of scale was a limiting factor for a start. In early modern Europe, wars involved tens of thousands of troops. In contrast, military confrontations in New Netherland, regardless of whether the opponents were European or Native American, were minor skirmishes, with dozens or at the most a few hundred soldiers. In a European setting, Building large-scale fortifications was an elaborate process of implementing advanced technology. In comparison, New Netherland fortifications were minor constructions. Even so, the mindset in the colony was determined by what colonists were used to back in Europe. This is illustrated by the grandiose plans for a five-pointed fort Amsterdam, which never came to fruition. Even the construction of stone walls, an adaptation to local circumstances, took over 30 years to complete, an example of the clash between European plans and American realities. The development of fortifications in New Netherland also shows a slow transformation from the exclusive use of forts, that is, military-style constructions, such as Fort Amsterdam and Fort Orange, intended to boost territorial claims, to the addition of palisades and blockhouses, such as in Kingston, Albany and Schenectady. 
Perimeter defenses were primarily intended to defend the colonial population, with the blockhouse as a multi-purpose building and a defensive structure of last resort. That development connects Fort Amsterdam of 1626 to the Palisade and blockhouse of Schenectady of the 1670s. Thank you.